Um, I, I want to just continue in this series <clears throat> that I've entitled, Be, Be an Overcomer. Uh, and we've been dissecting, processing through a, a, a few different areas of our life, overcoming disappointment, overcoming doubts. Uh, th this morning, uh, what I want us to look into, and I've just entitled distinctly this, this morning's message, Conquering the Guilt of Sin. Conquering the, the Guilt of Sin. And anybody ever sinned before? Hopefully everybody's hand went up. Anybody ever felt guilty because of the sin? How many of you have felt guilty before you even accepted Jesus? That's good. How many of you enjoyed the guilt that you felt? Then why'd you sin again? It's just part of our, our flesh. Let's be honest. Part of our our flesh. I, I don't think we wake up and determine, I think I want to sin today. We, we know better than that, especially if we've accepted Jesus and we're, we're walking with Jesus. But temptations are real. Struggles are, are real in life. And there are, are different occurrences that, that trigger emotions, trigger points within our lives we, we might would say that, that tend to lead us down a path, that tend to lead us down a journey. And if we go far enough down that path, we realize we might cross a line. We might sin. And then guilt begins to invade our life again. But there's help. The good thing is there's, there's help. There's, there's answer in those experiences of life. And so I've just entitled this morning's message, Conquering the, the Guilt of Sin. Uh, read along with me in, in John chapter 3. We're going to read through the, r roughly the first half of this passage. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus then answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirits. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirits. You should not be surprised at my saying that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Continue with me, verse 9. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of the earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And let's finish with this last famous scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Father, we say thank you for your word this morning. Lord, help us to, to rightly walk in your revelation. God, I just ask that you would not only speak to my heart, God, but that, that you would speak to each one of our hearts individually. God, that we would be nudged, spurred in the right direction. God, as we desire to walk in greater fellowship with you, Lord, each day of our life. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Amen. M many of you might have read this portion of Scripture once, maybe a few times in your life. The account here of Nicodemus, just summarizing, how do you enter the kingdom of God? How is somebody born again if they're already old? These are, these are real questions. Uh, and luckily, they're real questions that have answers. And, and I pray as we, we expound on the, the revelation this morning that we might capture a greater truth, a greater revelation of, of what God has desired for, for each one of us. We know according to the scripture that, that, that Nicodemus obviously had questions, so he comes to Jesus at night. There's thoughts as to why Nicodemus maybe came to Jesus at night. Uh, some would say, many have often said, because he feared to be seen with Jesus. So what better than to come talk to Jesus at, at night? But I think maybe more so, these are both good men and men who are really busy. Not, not just anybody walked up to Nicodemus. Uh, but most people, like busy people today, they had to make an appointment to, to see Nicodemus. He, he probably already had a lot of things going on throughout the context of the day. We look into the life of Jesus, and, and Jesus was all often doing something, doing things, mi ministering with people. And so Nicodemus thought, saw that maybe this might be a good time. Who knows? But we know that he, he went to him. But let's look into the life of Jesus, I mean the life of Nicodemus, just for a, a brief moment. We, we recognize that he was a good man. Probably one of the most moral men that lived in his time. How, how do we, we know that? We, we understand this because he was a, a ruler of the Jews. Not, not just anybody was seen as the ruler of, a Jews, of the Jews. Not, not just anybody gained that position of life. Be, because of so, we realize that he was a, a member of the, the Sanhedrin, the, the official ruling body of the Jews. And Jesus told this gentleman that he needed to be born again. To be born again. If such an individual, a good man, probably one of the most moral men that lived of that time, needed to be born again, then I believe we come to the obvious conclusion that it's not just our good works that saves us. It's not just living a, a moral life that saves us. There, there, there must be something more. There, there must be something greater to experience in life. And, and Jesus identifies that with him, that, that you must be born again. One, one of the outstanding evangelists during the early years of the American history often preached this particular message. You, you must be born again. After hearing it many times, what, 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 one day somebody walked up to him and asked him, why, why do you preach on this subject so much? He looked at that individual and simply said, because you must be born again. We all, we all need that experience. What we classify as salvation, a rebirth, being born again. So I want to answer four questions through the revelation of God's Word this morning. What, what is the new birth? What is the new birth? As we begin this thought, wanting to answer this question, let me identify this from the beginning. I don't believe one is born into this world as a Christian. You, you aren't born a Christian. 
I've often asked people, how, how long have you been saved? And I've had various people respond, well, I guess I've been saved my whole life. Couldn't be. Because you're not born a Christian. You're not born a, a believer of Jesus Christ. Look, look, look in Scripture. Turn back a page or two. John chapter 1 for just a moment. John 1. Let, let's just, we could look at a lot, but let's just look at a couple verses. Pick up with me in the 12th verse. It states, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Catch verse 13. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Just because I was born into this world doesn't mean that I'm saved, that I'm a, a believer. I, I have to at some point point in my life, make a choice to accept Jesus as the Savior of my life. There's many, many wonderful babies, children that are, are born into a Christian home, a Christian family. But let me identify this. This cannot, they cannot become citizens of the kingdom of God unless they believe upon Jesus Christ. Christianity, Christianity is not transmissible, nor is it inheritable. What, what do I mean? My children are not Christians because I'm Christians. Now, let me stop right here. I'm not at all minimizing the effect of a Christian home in the value of a Christian home. I'll be the first to stand and say, what a blessing to be raised by parents who are believers of Jesus Christ, who demonstrated that every day of my life. E even, even now, when my dad and I have conversations, when my mom and I have conversations, often they're spiritual conversations, processing scripture, thoughts, revelations of God, truths of, of God into my life. But hear me, just because my parents are Christians doesn't at all mean that I'm a Christian. It might increase the probability that I would become a Christian, but at some point I have to make that choice to accept Jesus as the Savior of my life. We grow to a point a place and it might be different from one to the next where we, we personally <clears throat> Excuse me, we, we personally receive Jesus Christ as our Savior through repentance of sin and faith in who Jesus Christ is. This new birth that we're talking about this morning, it's a divine and I believe it's a complete work. When I ask Jesus, when the Bible says, when I, I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I am completely saved. Now, I might grow in that experience, I might grow in that relationship, but at at that moment, I am a saved believer of Jesus. I would say a divine change. It's God's work within my life. It's God's work in, in your life. I, I, would, I would go as far as to say, I, I believe that this would be a marked moment in your life. A marked, we, we have marked moments that we know are divine moments within our lives. I've said this many times. I, I can take you to the exact place where I know I made that confession of faith unto Jesus Christ. Where I know that I know that I know that Jesus became the Savior of my life. Now, now hear me, I, I was raised in a, in a godly home. I, I, I was in church within just a few hours of being born. Not, not weeks, but just a few hours of actually being born. I, I heard this scripture from the time that I was a baby. My, my, my parents were faithful to impart God's word into my life, but yet I, I still remember that moment as a child that I said, Jesus, I need you to be the savior of my life. I'm asking that you would forgive my sins. I'm confessing that I believe 
in you. And then we grow. It's not education. We don't get all this education. And because I've gained enough wisdom on the truth of God that I am now saved. We need education. We need to grow. But I've got to believe it in my heart and make that confession with my, my mouth. That acceptance of who Jesus is. And, and though I'm growing and yet still growing in that relationship with God, maturing, I don't yet believe I have all the answers and understand everything. I love I, to say I could describe to you everything that happens in my life and in your life, but I don't have all of those answers. But I do know what happened that day when I accepted Jesus into my life, that divine work that has continued, as I've said many times, to, to progress. The, the new birth is a complete change in that one does not come to Jesus halfway and keep part of himself unto himself. I, I, I don't commit part of my life to Christ and say, Lord, I, I'm going to reserve this part for myself. I don't believe that's what Jesus is looking for. Jesus is looking for that total surrender, that total commitment unto him. An old saying goes like this. It doesn't take much of a man to be a Christian. But it takes all of him that there is to be a Christian. Simply, I've got to give all that I am in order to be a follower of Jesus. No, number two, why? Why does one need that new birth? Why do I need that new birth? Why do you? Why, why do your children? Why, why do your friends need that new birth? There, there's a few reasons for this. Let me just identify a, a few of these. First, the, the Word of God simply says so. The, the Word tells us that we need this new birth. Je, Jesus tells Nicodemus here in, in, in John chapter 3 that, that you must be born again. That, that this ought to be enough for our life without any other reason. For, for, for we accept that the Bible is, is the, the whole Word of God is the complete Word of God. It, it is the, 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 the infallible Word of God into our lives. And, and if God says that I need to be born again, then simply that should be good enough for me. God's nature requires that I need to be born again. Why? Because we believe that God is perfectly righteous perfectly righteous and I believe in order to have fellowship with him we need to enter into his presence wash clean uh, think back to the process that they went through in the Old Testament the cleansing process in order to enter into the Holy of Holies hear me church the sacrifice has changed because Jesus has paid the sacrifice for us but the expectation is still the same that we enter into the presence of God I need to be cleansed I, I need to be washed through the blood of Jesus the touch of Jesus into my life our own nature requires a, a new birth we're sinners as we've identified we need this transformational experience to bring peace to our soul regarding our, our spiritual condition so that we can stand rightly before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, another one, there's a fact that underlines all others about humans is that, that, that each one of us, as we identified at the very beginning, are, are sinful individuals, sinful people. We're, we're born sinful, the Bible identifies. Sin, sinners because of birth. We're sinners because of our choice. We're, we're sinners because of our practice. The Bible plainly teaches the fact that, that we are born sinners. When Adam sins, we might would say he poured poison into the human race. Theologians often refer to this as the, uh, the Adamic sin, the Adamic um, 
practice of life, simply meaning that, that we've gained this sinful nature from our parents, passed down from one generation to the next generation, the next. We're, we're born, the psalmist puts it this way, I was born a sinner. From birth, that's why I needed a savior. I needed somebody to redeem my life. Our choices, each one of our choices identify that we're sinners. We, we need this new birth experience. When we come to the place where we can decide, we often, invariably, we choose wrong. We choose the way of sin. Whether we call this weakness of our human nature or tendencies inherited from our, our parents, who knows? But we're sinners by choice. We choose the way of wrong. And then it becomes a practice in our life. We don't just sin once, but many of us, we've sinned multiple times within our, our lives. As the years pass by, we tend to find it easier and easier. Because we've allowed the choice of sin to grow, to abound within our lives. And then we get to where we want to get to us today. This guilt consumes us. This guilt begins to overwhelm our lives. We come to the realization that as hard as we try to fix this sinful nature, these sinful choices... And I believe that we pour a lot of energy into wanting to make the necessary changes. We, we come to this realization at whatever point within our lives of being born a, a sinner, choosing sin and, and practicing sin and the guilt overwhelms, we realize, I need help. I need help. I'm tired of the guilt. I'm tired of the shame. I tend to believe that's probably where Nicodemus was. He had heard it. He had seen the miracles of Jesus. He had seen the touch of Jesus. He, he realized that most people would have classified him as a good man, a, a morally right man. Yet there is, I, I happen to believe, a, a, an overwhelming feeling of guilt within his life. How, how do I know? Because I had the same feeling. He lived years trying to figure this out. Probably tried many practices, many techniques. Let's be honest, in, in the world that we live in today, there's all different types of helps to get past the various feelings that we feel. I kind of think Nicodemus was in the same place. And he probably figured, this is enough. I'm going to go find this guy. And I'm going to see what he has to say. Because it sure appears that everybody else's life is miraculously transformed that he encounters. Maybe the same could be true of me. So at night, he goes and he tracks this Jesus down. And he doesn't say, how do I get rid of this guilt? But in essence, he does. What must I do to enter the kingdom of God? Because the kingdom of God represented purity, re represented the absence of, of guilt, the absence of shame, the, the absence of the torment of life. H how do I get there? How do I have that experience? And Jesus just simply says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how? how? How can I be born again? I've grown, I'm, I'm old now. And Jesus just simply says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Identifying you, you need this distinct experience of life. You need the forgiveness of sin. What's the result of the forgiveness of sin? 
the removal of guilt within our life. Shame within our life. Every person that chooses to become a believer of Jesus, a, a child of God, knows right from wrong. Why? Because of God's revelation has come to them through, through various means into their lives. That, that feeling of guilt intensifies and, and, and more guilt feelings arise within our lives. But that, that new birth experience, I, I believe, is the only cure for the removal of the guilt of sin within our lives Think back to that moment that you accepted Jesus as the Savior of your life. I don't know about you, but man, that was a good feeling in my life. The release of the burden of sin. The release of the guilt of sin. The greatness of peace that just flooded into my life. That assurance that, that flood into my life. How beautiful it was. I'm sure shortly thereafter the feelings had the opportunity to change. Why? Because that's what Satan does. He comes in and begins to work overtime in our lives. Why? Because he realizes that we've now partnered with Jesus. Begins to question that, that salvation experience. What is he simply trying to do to, to stir that guilt back up within our lives again? What, what do we need to do? We need to continuously to remind, to remind Satan of the work of Jesus, the cleansing of Jesus, the, the washing of Jesus within our lives. That we don't allow Satan to gain a, a position, to allow Satan to gain a, a presence within our lives. Again, we, we got to remind Satan, but sometimes I've got to remind myself of, of what Jesus has done for my life. How he's cleansed me, washed me clean again. And many times within my life. Leads me to question number three. What? What will this new birth do for us? I'm not sure any one illustration or figure of speech is sufficient to describe all that happens when a sinner comes to Christ. But let me just give a few of these. You've probably heard some, if not all of these. They are washed in the blood of Jesus. That's something that happens. We pass from death unto life according to Scripture. Another one, they become children of God with the new birth experience. They are saved. We call it salvation. Part of the new birth experience. We're, we're justified from our sins. Here's another one. We, we are made new creatures in Christ. These are just some of the phrases that we find in God's Word in context with the new birth experiences. I, I believe all of these phrases describe the change that comes both in our, our status before God and also within our, our personal life. But with this, once again, the guilt, the guilt of past sins is taken away in this new birth experience. He died on the cross for us. He did for us which was necessary to secure that pardon of sin. That pardon from the guilt of sin within our lives. When we come to Christ in repentance, when we come to Christ in faith, God removes, I believe, that accumulation of the guilt of the past transgressions within our lives. The Bible says that he remembers them no longer. It goes on to say that he, he cast them as far as from the east is from the west in another portion of, of Scripture. The point of all of these statements is that God has dealt with the guilt of sin within our lives through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He's paid the price. I have to let go of it and truly trust that God has forgiven me, that God has redeemed my life. And once again, not, not to allow the enemy to flood this back into my life over again. Let, let me give you a little bit of hope here this morning also with the revelation of Scripture. I, I believe even the guilt 
of our future sin is covered for. God didn't just die for our sins in our past. How do I know? Because he died for us before we were even born. So he's died. He's paid the price for the guilt of my, my future sins. Some have said, and let me help us for just a moment. Some have said, if, if I believe that, I would sin all that I want to because I, I know that I would already be forgiven. Don't get ahead of yourself. I still have to confess and ask for forgiveness of those sins when they take place. Allow the cleansing work of Jesus within my within my life we're transformed by the Holy Spirit's and the reality is when I accept Jesus I really don't want to continue to live in that sin I don't want to walk in that sin I mean I, I'd love to say I've lived a perfect life since Jesus has redeemed me but that's not the truth but the good the good experiences from each moment on when I've messed up and I have felt that, that guilt begin to rise in my life again. I can confess that once again unto Jesus. Reclaiming my belief in Jesus. Receiving the washing, the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. And once again, he begins to remove that guilt. Repentance simply means to change one's mind concerning sin. We often identify to, to walk away, but I, I believe in order to turn to walk away, I, I, I need that transformational work of Christ in my mind, turning me away from sin, that I, I want not to participate in the work, the life, the experience of sin. Again, and that's the continual transformational process that takes place. That, that's the necessity of, of growing in God's Word. That's the necessity of growing in the relationship with God, that I, I become more active, more active in my obedience unto God, that I, I don't want to surrender to the work of the enemy within my life, but I, I want to continuously to surrender to the work of Christ, leading me away from sin to that eternal life forever with Jesus. Born-again people I don't believe, really want to sin. They, they want to live that right life. But the beauty, once again, is if we do happen to stumble, because we realize the righteous do stumble, God's there to help us up. God's there to cleanse us, to wash us, to forgive us uh, once again. So, so, so how, let, question last, let me begin, begin to conclude with this, number four. How are we born again? How can we be born again? I've really already identified that, but let me summarize it with this. We have to realize we've sinned and be willing to repent, to ask forgiveness and to repent of our sins. But what does this mean that I am, I am genuinely sorry for the mistakes in my life? The acts against God that I have committed and I want to be cleansed and I realize I can't do it myself so I need the work of Christ within my life secondly we simply have to receive Jesus as our personal Savior I, I've quoted it once but let me quote it again that I I must believe in my heart and who Jesus is, but I also must confess it with my mouth. I've got to make that, that confession of who Jesus. I, got, I have to believe, but I also must confess that He is the personal Savior of my life. Let me give you an interesting thought here. The Bible says that I don't have to follow Jesus to become a Christian. Many times we believe we have to be a follower of Jesus to be a Christian. Hang with me for just a moment. The Bible says that I must believe in my heart and confess with my mouth. Then I become a believer, a Christian. At that point, I believe a Christian then chooses to follow Jesus. 
to follow Christ. I want to walk with him because I realize how, how good he is. The beautiful work that he's done within my, my life. The message Jesus gave to Nicodemus was perhaps the most basic lesson he taught during his ministry. All calls to righteous living are, are based on the fact that we have now become a believer of Jesus. A believer of Jesus. And now that I believe and I've accepted his, his salvation, that new birth, what comes with it? Growth, maturity, progression with him. That desire now to want to wanna follow him. I mean, when, I, when I was living in sin, I didn't have that desire to follow Jesus. I, I was running away from him, but, but now that I've had this new birth experience, now, now I want to follow Jesus. Now, now, as we talked about last week, I, I, I want to do the things that produces spiritual growth within my life. I, I want to get in God's word. I want to be in prayer with him. I, I do want to worship him. I, I do want to surrender my life to service unto him. Why? Because I realize how good he is to me, how beautiful he has been into my life. Hear me. Could we live in this new birth experience daily within our lives? Could we walk in what God has done, wanting to encourage others, wanting to inspire others because we know what Christ has done in, in our life, what Christ has done in, in my life? How beautiful it's been. For the salvation wasn't just for you. But he says the salvation is for all who will believe. But now I have to live in that experience. I have to share that experience. I have to demonstrate that experience with others. That, that why that I might could encourage them. That they could find the, the experience of peace. The removal of guilt. Hear me, because those that are living in sin, once again, they're, they're living in the guilt of the sin, the, the shame of the sin. They, they're, they're not enjoying it any more than you and I enjoy that. They're looking for hope. And I believe we have the hope in Jesus, that experience in Jesus. Amen.